thank you for for listening. You know, sometimes I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to say. I have a general sense sometimes. But sometimes we just let things flow from the Varden or the Holy Spirit. If we can surrender and just let this consciousness through. Varden is a message to those souls who um, desire to return to the Godhead, to the total the state of total awareness, which is far beyond matter, energy, space, and time. Now, this morning I'm going to speak among other things about the law of um, <clears throat> excuse me the law of silence and there's some things that, that I would like to clarify for um, for some people that have been following me whether that's listening to my talks or whether they're actually reading um, the Varden card discourses or re have read some of my books Um, well, first of all, I have to say right up front, for those who don't know, <clears throat> Bardenkar is the ancient science of out-of-body soul projection, where soul moves by, the individual moves by its own, his, his or her own volition into these higher states via out-of-body soul projection or out-of-body soul travel or whatever you want to term it. Um, the idea being that, <clears throat> that we have to move into these states, <clears throat> excuse me, and move, move is not the correct word really, but we, well, in the beginning we move, eventually we, we get beyond time and space, but all these different states of consciousness, all these different planes exist simultaneously, and so it's really the, the, science of total awareness so that we move or put our place our attention and we find that we have all of these states simultaneously <clears throat> but this sounds you know easy and in a sense it is and yet it's not um it's deceivingly difficult um to achieve this at the higher levels beyond matter, energy, space, and time, because we're dealing with the physical body, the astral body. The astral plane is not the end all, be all that that some people think it is. This goes beyond astral projection. Astral projection is limited to the astral plane. But anyway, um, just a quick introduction before I get into the subject of the law of silence. So we have these various planes, and we have a God wants chart on on the Vardenkar website. If there's a video, hopefully you're seeing the God wants chart. But a lot of you have, have already um, been through this information. So <clears throat> continuing on, the law of silence is an interesting thing. Now I've because of my position as the living Varden master, um, and because of what was neat, what has been needed, um, according to the will of, of the Varden or spirit and, and the will of God or the Hure, we call God the Hure. It's the highest God. It's not um, male nor female. It's actually beyond description. But it can be experienced. It starts, uh, the experience starts at the 10th plane and moves into the 12th. And of course, there's more than 12 planes. But this Hure, nothing can really be said about it. Um, but it has to be experienced. But I've had to form words in in the ver some of the books and some of the talks, mostly the books, 
that have been written. Um, there's several of them that also my my lovely wife and garden master, uh, Shri Heather, uh, Shri Heather Jamboy. Um, also, her spiritual name is Gashay Sa. We've written these various books in an attempt to, and, and written discourses and given talks and quite a bit of writing over the last five years. Um, this is 2018. In an attempt to express, uh, not to impress people, to express some of the experiences, not to impress people, but to help um to help them understand and guide them. Now this will only work for those who are, are sincere God seekers. Those who don't have the eyes to see or the ears to hear will will not understand. They're just simply not ready. And you know, we're not Christians, but the Jesus said, you know, to cast pearls, I believe he said to cast pearls before the swine. Not that people that aren't ready are swine, but the idea is that they don't see it as being of any value, or they might even be angry at it. Because the fact is the multitudes want to remain asleep. Um, the multitudes or the masses want to remain in ignorance. Um, and, they, and they'll never be ready for Vardenkar. Vardenkar is for a very small number of chosen people who actually want to go into these ecstatic states and are willing to 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 learn this ancient science of Tusa travel or soul travel or bilocation or whatever term you want to use, soul projection, and move into these various states. Now the problem, and this is what I want to address here, is Heather G and I, or um, Shra Sh- uh, Sh- Heather Jamboy and I have, and my name's Alan Feldman, we've um, written a, a lot of things about these different planes and different masters and different experiences. And I guess you could say we've really pushed the envelope on this law of silence. Now, whenever we at, we share an experience that we've had, a spiritual experience, we have to be very careful because bringing it out into the physical by speaking about it, by talking about it, can actually um, destroy the experience itself. In other words, we, we no longer... The experience, it's almost like um, like a steam locomotive develops p- pressure from the steam. It's almost like letting out the the um, letting out the uh, the steam out of the pressure and it loses its power. Uh, it's more than this because the those that aren't ready are really not ready and when we when we start to speak about our inner experiences we have to be very very careful it's best especially in the beginning the first few years pretty much it's best to keep the law of silence when we speak about these experiences it tends it tends to destroy them now you might ask, well, why do I speak about so many experiences? Why do I write about so many experiences? Um, it's, it's a good question. <laughs> sometimes I sincerely wonder because sometimes, to be honest with you, it doesn't, do, it doesn't do anybody any good because people don't, the people that aren't ready just don't understand what I'm talking about. Uh, and then they think I'm making it up or they think um, it's not real. And frankly, it's it's quite bizarre, expected, but but bizarre. And I have no right to be upset about it because they're simply not ready and they're not going to understand. They don't have the eyes to see or the ears to hear. So they're, they're going to be reading about this stuff and it's not going to register as being anything of great value. 
because frankly they're materialists they are looking for the phenomena of the lower worlds are looking for the physical emotional um, mental aspects of life and most of these people are suitable for religion or or metaphysics or or just downright materialism and frankly there's not a whole lot of difference in some ways respects between these these three these three areas that I mentioned um, the metaphysicians often are just seeking materialism through the manipulation of spirit or the psychic forces or the lower forces the religionists often um, are clinging to emotionalism and and perhaps some kind of mental understanding a lot of the religions are with all due respect are formed by leaders who want to control the masses but man and the philosophers are, are most of them are hardly any better um they're trapped in uh these these dogmatic belief systems and these dogmatic ideas now to the non-spiritual the spiritual appears to be hypocrisy and so people will say well Vardenkar has all this dogmatic beliefs and I'm talking about different planes and it's all dogma and it's not true or it's just based on some other teaching but I but I say that the exper the individual this is an individual path the individual has to have these experiences. So I'm kind of put between a rock and a hard place. You know, I could talk about this till the cows come home. And I know that most people will not understand a word of what I'm talking about. And But there are those out there who, who have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. And they do understand what I'm trying to do with these works. And this is what Palsy tried to do when he formed, when he began Ekinkar, which was really just a continuation of this path of total awareness, this path of bilocation or the use of soul travel or Tusa travel or, or soul projection. The idea that, that, that these methods have been ancient of leaving one's body and having these experiences. But when we start to speak about our experiences, then we begin to dance on this edge of violating the law of silence. And I am not an example of what to do because, frankly, I'm compelled by spirit and I'm on the very edge here of, of sharing Things that can't really be shared. And that's this is the whole paradox. Is that these experiences are indescribable. And yet. You know we. We can attempt. The mystics have attempted to describe some of this. I've attempted to do it. Paul G has on occasion. Uh, he attempted to do it. Um, we write. We go into these states. And frankly. Nobody really. Most people don't believe they exist. And then we try to write about them. The problem is you can't. So what do you do? So you try to express them. And you know that no matter what you do, no matter what you write, um, that you're not able to bring the experience into this world except perhaps there's a certain vibration this and this vibration is the varden or the sound current the light and sound and so you bring out this small part of that it's like a golden thread the varden is a golden thread so fine as to be invisible and yet so strong as to be unbreakable that binds all beings together in all worlds and the ancient Varden masters, whatever path we, the name was, it, it could have been called Ekankar, it could have been called Vardenkar, it could have been, there are many, many different names and different races and different masters. But throughout the ages, this has been the, the direct path, which is the path of soul projection. 
because frankly, you can think all you want, you can do all you want, you can dance, you can sing, you can, you know, do the hokey pokey, you can be emotional, you can pour out your astral body with love, with human love and attached love and, and all of these things, astral love, and you can study and read and philosophize all you want. But the hure or God is, is unmoved by these things. It doesn't really care about these lower aspects of life. Now, I'm not trying to say that we don't do these things. We really have to, in a sense. We, we have to think. We have to read. We, we work as best we can with the tools that we have. Because it's not that they're bad. The problem comes when they become the foundation of the individual's life. When the foundation of the individual's life becomes dogmatic thinking, ideas, books, philosophies, um, cherished beliefs and opinions, you know, when, when that becomes the foundation of the individual's life, then it becomes um, stagnant, it becomes dead in a sense that the most people are stuck in a particular level of consciousness and they will remain pretty much in that state of consciousness for their entire lifetime, their entire incarnation in that particular body. This is sad but true. From As they say, from cradle to grave. Souls incarnate and they maintain this similar state of consciousness. Now they learn things as far as the mind and emotions, I mean, somebody may study engineering and become very good with mathematics and and um, architecture or building machines and physics and and all of these Rube Goldberg type things and and that's all good. There's nothing wrong with that, except when it becomes the foundation of the individual's life. So the human being as a as the mind and, and physical body and astral body and these lower aspects of us are capable of all kinds of feats of great complexity. You know, kind of like a trained seal um, on steroids. You know, we can learn through education and practice all kinds of gymnastics and mental gymnastics and emotional gymnastics. And we can do all of these things but until we have the state of, of the self-realization and God-realization, until we move into these states of consciousness above time and space, matter and energy, it's all about consciousness is what I'm trying to say. Now, the law of silence is a little bit difficult to discuss. And I'm a bad example of it. Um... If you've read any of my books, like Dialogues with Rebbe Zartars, Dialogues with Yabo Sakabi, um, Heather G. and I wrote a book called Thousands of Visits to Heaven and the Heart of God. Um, there's some new books coming out soon. Right now it's um, August of 2018, so we should have some books, some more books coming out. But we've got about four that are that have been published, and we're going to have more coming out soon. But if you've read any of the books or you've read any of the discourses and you've, especially the books, um, there's a lot of experiences that we describe somewhat in, in, in detail as best we can. And so this, we do this not because it's a good idea for, for, for other people to do it, or, or that it's a re uh, accurate representation of of the experience, or you're going to get the experience vicariously through reading a book or listening to a talk about the experience. That's not the point. But a lot of people who don't understand will, will think that's the point. They'll think that, that to read about the experience is the same as to have the experience, or they will conclude falsely that the experience is it's just made up, it's fictional, And there's really nothing I could do about this, or really, frankly, that I want to do about this. But I wanted to say that when we 
break this law of silence, we often d- destroy the, the experience that we had. And especially in the beginning, you know, until we reach into these higher states, and I'm talking about self-realization, God-realization, for the most part, there's we are entrusted with this sacred knowledge, this secret knowledge. And as we move up in consciousness, and I have to say about initiations, you know, most paths, the initiation is a ceremony. But in Vardhankar, the initiation goes beyond this. Each initiation corresponds with establishing oneself in a, in a different plane. So the second initiation is establishing oneself as a resident of the astral plane. The third initiation would be the causal and so on. So each of these initiations corresponds with the establishing oneself in this particular plane uh, area of, of awareness. And these are actually different levels of heaven, different planes, states of consciousness, which exist simultaneously. And you have the microcosm and you have the, ma- the macrocosm. The microcosm being in- inside, the macrocosm being outside. So in the, in the mind, when, you go, when you're looking at the mental plane, you're looking at the lower planes that, that go through this mind, everything is split up into this dichotomy of, of love and hate, mountains and valleys. You have all these opposites. And, you, and spirit is mixed with, heavily mixed with matter, energy, time, and space. So you have all these paradigms and paradoxes. So everything seems contradictory. So if I make a statement, um, whatever that statement is, you can go on the other side of the coin and say, well, that's not true. <laughs> and this is the nature of the lower worlds. And as long as we're in this state of analysis, you know, analysis paralysis, as long as we are thinking and feeling with our emotions, um, it's not that this is bad. The problem is when the individual center of their consciousness is centered in these lower states. So we have to learn detachment because as long as we're in the lower worlds, as long as we have a physical body, or an astral body, or a causal body, or a mental body, we're kind of stuck with the equipment. You know. But at the same time, we can leave the body by our own volition, and we can have these experiences. And so soul is not permanently trapped inside its skull, or inside the physical body, or the astral body, or any of the lower bodies. Now when we do this, when we go out of the body... Um, and have these various experiences, you know, some of which we've talked about in some of the books, some of it, I'm sure some of you listening have had your own experiences, and you don't have to be in Vardenkar to have experiences. Uh, people of all paths and faiths, and, and people that don't have a path, that are walking their own path, have all had various experiences. Not all of them, but many of them, some of them might not be aware of them, These experiences can take place in the dream state. They can take place in the waking life during meditation or contemplation or spiritual exercises. They can take place at any moment. Um, Often they're they're happening and we're not aware of them. But as as somebody begins to practice the path of Varnagar and they start to do spiritual exercises and study the works and practice the works... Um, because it's it's a science. There's there's, it's not just you just don't sit there and chant and well you could, but um, but eventually you reach a point where you realize that that um, that there are things that need to be applied. There's a meth- methodology to it, just like any other science. Or you know, if you want to learn to play the piano, yeah, you can sit down at a piano and just start pounding away. And you might even make some pretty music, but at some point you're going to realize that uh, you're going to hit a wall. 
And if you want to get better, you're going to have to have a teacher and you're going to have to start um, learning the fundamentals of, of piano and music. You know, there'll be a point where you can only get so good um, before you're going to need a teacher, before you're going to be able, need to... Uh, now, there's always exceptions to some degree, but with Vardenkars, you're dealing with such a complex subject with so many different rocks and shoals and pitfalls that it's far, far more difficult than learning to play a musical instrument or the piano or learning science or carpentry or anything like that. Now, some people have asked, well, wh why do I need a spiritual master? Why can't I just do it myself, figure it out myself? And, well, a lot of this comes from the fact that most of the so-called spiritual masters are pseudo-masters. or they don't. A master can only take you as high as that master has gone himself. So if a master has only reached the astral plane or the causal plane, that's as far as they're going to take their students. So yes, if you're if you're if you're talking about false masters, there is a case that can be made because a lot of us have been burned by these people that call themselves masters, and many of them, frankly, aren't aren't masters. They're not even mystery school, mystery school teachers. So I understand that that people have been burned, that they've been led astray, lied to, uh, deceived. Often the people that deceive them are delusional or they're doing it for reasons of vanity or manipulation or they're trying to to um, create some kind of benefit for themselves, feed off of the energy of the group. I'm very aware of, of these types of things. But a true master is a true a spiritual traveler who is able to consciously dwell in these higher worlds while simultaneously carrying on. It's Paul G. called it bilocation. It's really the fact that soul is beyond time and space. And so at first we learn to move into these higher states of awareness um, and we start to learn the differences between the physical plane, the astral plane, the causal plane, the mental plane. We start to learn um, soul travel, soul projection. And then eventually we transcend that into direct projection. We become proficient at being able to move into these higher planes consciously so that we're aware of them. And during this whole process, we have to be very careful about this law of silence. Loose lips sink ships. And um, so we learn to move into these higher states. And this generally takes a while. This isn't something that happens instantly. You have to have a tremendous amount of patience and love, love for God, devotion. It, you know, how long it takes depends. So some of you have already had some of these experiences. Um, but eventually the individual, after they've reached the stage of being able to move into these higher states, um, but even before this to some degree, they are able to, they recognize that there, that there is no here and there. That soul is not occupying a particular place in time and space, and that they can bilocate or put their attention simultaneously on, on two different planes, or, or even more than that. And they've actually been doing this all along, they just weren't aware of it, to some degree they've been doing it. But now, after we've gotten to the point where we can move into these states consciously, via the spiritual exercises and the different practices of Vardenkar, and I know some of you don't believe any of this is true, but um, this is, you know, this is the saints and saviors and and the the great spiritual masters of the world and the ones that maybe aren't so great but they've achieved something. They all, anyone that that's worth their salt, any master guru who's worth their salt, knows to some degree what I'm saying is true. Um, but those that aren't spiritual always see the hypocrisy in it. They can't imagine anybody being higher than them or having some knowing something or having some experience that they can't have. 
Um, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They can't have it because they're not ready. They don't believe it. But these um, experiences are real. But they have to be... The individual has to experience them themselves. Otherwise, you're just talking about a dogmatic path. You're talking about a religion where people just read something and they believe it, but they never really know for sure because they never have the experience and then they put the leader, uh, often who's a dead person who died hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago, um, they put this leader on a pedestal. They even call him, you know, um, well, in the case of Jesus, you know, he's the son of God. And of course, they're saying that nobody else is. We're all the sons and daughters of, of the Hure or God. But he's like this special being that nobody else can touch. And of course, he's dead conveniently. So nobody can question the canon of the church or the, or the, the line of the leaders because the person that they're talking about as being this great being, this great saint or this um, God being it passed away. So conveniently he can't come back and say, wait a minute, you're wrong. We're not supposed to go to war. We're not or, or, you're teaching this all wrong. You're not doing, you're not practicing my teachings the way you're supposed to. You can't do that if you're dead. <laughs> and so um, you'll notice in a lot of these paths, they follow departed masters, so-called departed masters. A lot of them aren't really truly spiritual travelers in the highest sense. The Varden masters, such as um, Rebbe Zartars, Yabal Sakabi, Fubi Quants, Rami Nuri, there's many of them, um, have ran into these higher planes, and they've established themselves there on a conscious basis. And that's the thing is that we have to become conscious. We have to become aware and this is not as easy as it sounds because we're not talking about mental awareness where I explain, it's not a concept. You know, Vardenkar is not taught, it's caught. The individual has to have their own experiences. And this takes time. And as we have these various experiences, we begin to realize that the master is there to guide us, guide us, because there's a lot of rocks and shoals. There's a lot of traps, tremendous amount of traps. And one of the traps is speaking of, of violating the law of silence and talking about your own experiences. And so there's this temptation for people. They'll have an experience and then they'll blab about it to their family and their friends. And, you know, I left my body, I did this and I did that. And sometimes this will destroy the experience. It will bring it down in vibration. So this is something that those that sincerely want to reach into these higher states, such as self-realization on the fifth plane, um, God-realization on the 10th through 12th and beyond, they have to look at this seriously. And like I said, Heather G and I are... are Heather. And I are, are bad examples. Um, we've already had th these experiences long ago, and and other ones, and and we're already aware of much of this. Nobody has a hundred percent. Um, you know, if we were, if we we would be God if we if we knew all things, but um, and of course we're not. But. I'm kind of tripping over myself here with words. But you see, out of this love, we share experiences that can't really be shared, but we attempt, not because we want to impress anybody, or, or you know, wow, aren't you great, or something. That's not the point at all. Um... I'd soon as shut up about it. If that was the only point, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bother. You know, I have. All we do is get a lot of, mostly, a lot of flack. But I, I don't seek the limelight. I don't seek um, approval or admiration or any of these things. What I, 
my job as the living Varden Master, a spiritual traveler, is to take those souls who are ready to return back to the Hure or God, the highest God, and aid them in their return to help link them with the returning wave which is the Varden, the light and the sound of God. Now this returning wave, there's, it's interesting, there's two waves. There's the um, descending wave, which is the wave of creation, which sustains um, everything. And as it moves down in vibration, these different planes uh, are created or manifest. I'm not really describing it very well. But this all comes from the Godhead, from the ocean of love and mercy, from the Hure or God. And all of these planes, and I'm oversimplifying this, um, but all of these planes exist simultaneously, but each one has a different vibration. And and each each plane is an entire domain, universe. I, I, I see this is the problem with words. You know, these words just fall flat. I'm trying to use word, physical words to describe something. And I guess it's my job. But I know it's um, it can be pathetic at times. But and this is why we have to have the experience. And this is why most of what the Master does is give instructions on how the chila or student can have their own experiences. And so when they do have these experiences, we, we enter into this law of silence. Now, experiences can build on one another. And it's very important to have the proper attitude of appreciation for, for these various experiences. They can be very subtle. But if the chila or student or aspirant, um, at first the person joining is, is an aspirant. They're not even a chila. They haven't been initiated they're basically seeing whether the path fits them or not. But the aspirant will study the discourses and do the exercises and lay down some discipline for themselves. And the exercises are about a half hour a day. Um, and then some maybe some reading, like a half hour a day, something like that, or maybe more if they have time. So it's not like six hours a day or ten hours a day. But the aspirant will has to put some effort in, has to focus, because, a, you know, a cracked bell uh, will not ring properly. It will, a, a, a cracked bell will not ring properly because it's cracked. And so if the student tries to follow, like, two or three paths at the same time, they're not going to get anywhere. So it's important if, if someone decides to be an aspirin that they focus on Vardenkar for at least a two-year period. Otherwise, a tremendous amount of confusion sets in. It's like trying to ride two horses. At some point, they're going to go separate ways, and uh, you're going to have to choose. Um, and I've seen people that, that can't choose, and they end up getting ripped um, apart. They end up leaving without making any real progress because they're split. You know, I had a lady that said she wanted to follow Jesus, but she had already joined and she wanted to follow Jesus. So, I mean, I'm not saying you can't follow Jesus. I'm just saying that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to do something if you're not going to completely do it. If you're going to do it half-heartedly or half of it. So it's very important that the, that the aspirant or chila put in the necessary um, focus and effort. And this is why we have talks and we have books um, so that people can get an idea of, w of what this is all about to some degree, but until they have the experiences, they're not going to know. Some of you have had experiences already. Some of you have been in Vardenkar, of course, under a different name, different lifetime, different master, different path, as far as the name goes, but it was the path of out-of-body soul projection. 
And there have been various masters throughout history, such as Gopal Das in Egypt, uh, Laites in ancient China, um, Fubi Quants. There have been many masters who have taught Vardhankar under different names. Some of them had to do it underground because, frankly, they would be killed. And this law of silence was is, has always been a very important thing with the Vardhan masters. And they've learned over time pretty quickly that um, that they have to be careful about what they say, especially in in times when there's less tolerance for for religious freedom or spiritual freedom or there have been many times in human history where to talk about out of body soul projection and and leaving the body and going to these various planes was considered a heresy punishable by by death or torture and death. Um, so it's been, the law of silence has had many different stages throughout history. Many times the path is not public. It's it's private. It's very secret by word of mouth only. And um, we live in a time right now where we're fortunate enough to have the path open. It's, it's amazing how few people pr- appreciate it there's this tremendous crowding of um, clamoring of, of different spiritual people, including children that say they're from other planets and, and all kinds of things on YouTube and social media and books, you know, um, that are being published because now it's really inexpensive to, to publish books. Anybody can become an author, even if they're broke. And so everybody else and their mother's got a book out and their kids have books out and and um, and everybody's on you know all these people are on YouTube and they're t- calling themselves teachers and gurus and 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 saying what they want to say which is great it's, it's as far as like freedom of exchange of information um, creates mass confusion and so here I am <laughs> with a, a YouTube channel like surprise. Or, or I'm, I'm giving this talk, uh, whether you're listening uh, as a, just an audio or whether it's a video on, on one of the video sites or whatever whatever medium it is. And I'm, you know, there's all these people out there telling you this and telling you that. It's kind of funny in a sad way, but so here I am, another one. You know, some people say, oh, it's another guy. You know, how many are there? Millions of them, it seems. So, you know, how do you tell who's who and what's what? And that's the thing, is that soul knows. <laughs> but not everybody is, re- is ready for this. In fact, most people aren't. It's not for the masses. You know. And Paul G. or Paul Twitchell talked about this, wrote about this, he wrote the ama- the amazing book called The Tiger's Fang. It's, if you haven't read it, it's a classic. And he talks about his experiences in these different planes, these different worlds. And I've talked about some of my experiences in, in dialogues with Yabo Zakabi, dialogues with Rebbe Zartars. And like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. We share these things, and yet, we know that we're pushing the envelope on the law of silence, but remember, I'm I'm a I'm a Varden master. I'm the living Varden master. I can, to some degree, get away with some of the stuff that I wouldn't recommend that you try. <laughs> um, it's kind of like they they have those TV shows where they show somebody like lighting themselves on fire and and doing something crazy, and they're like. Don't do this at home. These are professionals, you know. <laughs> so, um, please don't emulate my behavior and uh, and start talking about your all your. Well, it's up to you what you want to do. And you know, if we do share something that maybe we shouldn't have shared, we move on. There's always another chance, but we have to be careful because this law of silence can be a. a like a sword, a two-edged sword, and we can get cut on it. And what can happen is the person has experiences and they destroy those experiences by sharing them, by talking about them. 
And so it's, like I said, it's like letting the steam out of a locomotive boiler. If we remain silent as we're having these experiences, as things are happening, then it's like the steam, the pressure builds. And it's very strange. It's like these experiences exist on a higher level, a higher vibration. And when we talk about it, it's like we kind of bring it down in vibration to the physical you know, when we start forming words and saying things, especially when we're sharing it with people who are per perhaps they're not ready for it, the vibrations are not compatible with their vibrations. And you, there's a saying that Paul used to say, and I agree 100%, never give anyone something that they don't want. And I didn't realize how true this was until recently. But people really get upset when you try to give them something they do not want. When somebody's not ready for certain spiritual information or certain spiritual or certain spiritual step, um, or they want to get out of the path because it's just too much, just vibrations are too high, the, the Varden moving through them uh, is too much, and they and they just they just don't want to go any further. They want to stop. Um, they're uncomfortable with it. It's look out. <laughs> um, you have to just let them go. And sometimes they get they become these channels for the negative power and they'll actually attack. Be they're, it's, they're, they're totally out of balance. And it's like they're... You know, the spiritually blind and deaf can be, can be very dangerous at times. And so I'm not talking about people that are neutral, that, that are following the middle path, because there are people that just disagree with what I'm saying, and I have total respect for that. I have no problem with people saying, you know, Alan, I don't believe what you're saying is true, and I respect you, but or maybe I don't respect you, but um, good luck, but this isn't for me. I have no problem with that at all. It's, but we get to these people that that just become vicious or angry, or um, it's like they've got a point to make. And uh, sometimes I think the point is in the top of their head. But um, I don't know. It's like get a life. You know, it's I, I try not to spend much energy criticizing other paths and other people. Um, although I know at times I'm guilty of that. But I'm not angry at anybody. I'm not upset uh, that Christianity exists or that, that whatever path exists. And that they have a difference of opinion. You know, that's one of the things I really like about the world right now, at least many parts of the world, like the United States, Canada, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is that as of this moment, there's religious tolerance. There's tolerance to discuss ideas, at least a lot of ideas, that wasn't present in some of the ancient times where you get your head cut off or you get burned to the stake or at least you'd be in trouble if you talked about some of these things. But then again, you know, it because we have this free exchange of information with the internet and books and publishing and, and telephones and email, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's very easy to, it's incredibly easy now to break the love silence because you know you're probably not going to get your head cut off. You're not going to get burned at the stake. You're not going to, you know, you probably won't lose your job if, if you talk about spiritual matters. And so there's this tendency for people to just let it all hang out and share everything that they've ever encountered, every experience they've ever had. So what I'm saying to you is, uh, is that this law of silence is an important aspect, which I don't talk about enough. This important aspect of the, of the spiritual life. You know, we do our spiritual exercises daily, and then as we have experiences, when we have experiences, and they can be very subtle, we, we recognize that sometimes we just can't discuss them or, or talk about them. We, ha we have to maintain this love silence in order to to progress more rapidly. It's a very it's a very interesting thing. 
And why exactly this works this way, it's a little complicated. We have the issue of the violation of trust because there are people that just aren't ready for this. And sometimes I cringe a little bit when I'm writing some of these books because I'm doing a lot of dictation from the light, you know, the, these wonderful masters like Rebbe Zartars, who's over 550 years old, incredible spiritual master. I know some people say he doesn't exist, but it's pretty funny. Um, Yabo Sakabi, who's even older. We're working on a book now. It's it's done. We just have to work on the editing, um, the final, uh, revi- you know, proofreading uh, dialogues with Rami Nuri, another incredible master. There's many, many great Varden masters, many, many that I've had the privilege of meeting and some that I haven't, many that I haven't. But um, these masters have tremendous gifts to give. And some of these gifts are very sacred, and some of them are very secret. And as we go up in initiations and we visit these various golden wisdom temples, uh, they're different temples on different planes. These are sanctuaries where we can go and study the the different volumes of the Shariat Kihure, um, which is the way of the eternal. And we can actually learn from from each plane so that we can go to the next in a more conscious way so there's a lot of inner things going on we we really shouldn't be talking about it for the most part and because there's a sacred trust there and i reveal a lot of things and sometimes i cringe and uh sometimes uh the masters will say things to me that i'm dictating i'm typing as fast as my little fingers can move, which isn't usually fast enough, but I, they're patient with me. And um, and I'm not that slow at typing. And uh, pages and pages and pages come out, and sometimes my eyes get a little wide because some of the stuff is really like, wow, we're going we're gonna to put this in a book. Okay. <laughs> and... Um, and, and and then sometimes when I'm trying to describe something, it's so hard to try to put into words something that happened on a plane that's beyond the mind. And you, and you know you can't, really. But you hope... Well, you don't hope. I guess the word... You surrender as best you can to the Holy Spirit or the Varden and do the best that you can with total humility and get and really get out of the way and that's a point that I wanted to make was we have to get out of the way the little self or the ego self is necessary but it's not us and the greater the individual as a channel for spirit or the varden is the more they're capable of getting out of the way because we are soul we're this eternal god being we're the spark of god Soul is an individual unit of awareness. It has seeing, knowing, and being. It is a 360-degree viewpoint. Soul is a happy entity. Soul knows through direct perception. It doesn't require a mind. When we're in the lower bodies, when we're in the physical world or the astral plane, or one of these lower planes of duality, we have to have these bodies in order to interact with these coarse vibrations. It's like a spacesuit. You have to have a spacesuit if you're in outer space. Or you're, or you're going to die. <laughs> well, soul doesn't die, of course, but soul, in order to interact, has to take on all these bodies. Otherwise, there'd be no... Imagine having no physical body, and you're in the physical world. You wouldn't be able to interact with any of the beings. You wouldn't be able to do anything here, except maybe observe, if that. So, um, it's very it's very interesting. So... In closing, well, first of all, I'm going to do a, a short hue. It's, um, <laughs> there's a group out there that's saying that the hue is evil or it's it's bad and it's going to hurt you. And it's, it never ceases to amaze me how people can just get so far off track. But, um, 
we're going to chant Hugh um, as in H U. So the H and then the U is is drawn out. It's a sacred name for gone. It's been used forever. Um, it's also the sound found on the Anami Lok, which is the tenth plane. Not the tenth dimension. We're not talking about dimensions. So we take a few deep breaths and we place our attention on the Tisra Till, which is the third eye. It's between the eyebrows, about an inch inside the skull. It's the spiritual eye. We take maybe five deep breaths, and then we're going to chant Hugh, as in H, and then the U. I might do it the other way, too. And this helps us tune into this sound current, which is the Varden. And we have the returning wave, and we have the descending wave, or the sustaining wave. And we're most interested in the returning wave. This wave of the light and sound that returns back into the heart of God or the Hure. So we take a few deep breaths. And you're welcome to try this or not try this. H U H U H U H U A can listen for the inner sound current and look for the inner light it could be a a white dot or a blue dot or it could be a light a gentle light or bright light it could be any color white purple blue even green or pink yellow this is the light of god it's it illuminates the path and shows the pitfalls and the sound is actually more important. It draws soul back into the back to God and through these various planes. And we may make contact with one of the masters or several of the masters. And they will work with us if we, if we give them permission. The law of non-interference states that they're, they're not going to interfere in your life if you don't want them to help you they won't help you um some of you have been in Varden car before with various masters and you may have an affinity for some of the Varden masters of the past or the present um some of this can get very subtle and those who hold on to their cherished beliefs and their cherished opinions are really not fit for the kingdom of God. One has to learn the middle path of detachment to be neither for nor against. One, In order to receive the, the living nectar of God, this light and sound, this love, wisdom, and power we have to empty our cup. We have to empty our vessel. 
you can't fill a pail of water with water if it's already filled with mud. You have to dump the mud out and wash it out, and then you may fill it with water. So those that are attached, that are attached to dogmatic belief systems, that are attached to their, their cherished opinions and beliefs, find it very difficult to let go of anything. And they've come to these conclusions based upon their own personal experiences and their misunderstandings. And see, the thing that Paul G. pointed out in The Flute of God, one of his books, great books, was that, and many of you know this, that spirit will mold, will, we make a mold and then spirit fills that mold. So if we really believe something is true, then we bring that into our world and, and it becomes a reality for us at that point. And there's all this evidence to, to prove that. And then, and then we, uh, and then we, you know, become sometimes the individual can become very defensive about their world, the way they see their world, their opinions and beliefs and cherished opinions, because they have this evidence which came out of the fact that they made this mold and the mold was filled. And we see this in, in all the time. I mean, a crude example would be if somebody really believed that everybody hated them and they believed that long enough, then their behavior might change to the point where people start disliking them. And then as people dislike them, they become angry and then they become worse and they treat people worse and they become angry because people are disliking them and then people dislike them more and more until finally one day they wake up and everybody hates them. And then somebody says, everybody doesn't hate you. And, oh, oh no, everybody hates me. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, I guess. But um, if the individual were to simply re recognize what had happened and there have been movies movie scripts written about this. There have been books written on this. People have had these experiences where there there's a certain state of consciousness they've assumed, and then that consciousness forms a mold which creates a certain life in a certain direction. Um, and then they get stuck with that for a while until they finally eventually realize that it's just uh, kind of an illusion or a mirage. But at the time... They're in the middle of the experience. It's very, very real. And so we have these uh, experiences and conclusions we come to and, and belief systems and cherished beliefs. And if we hold on to them too tightly, um, the, you know, they solidify. And um, we, get, we get all this evidence to support our, our uh, beliefs. And then we... Be, some individuals become so attached to them and they say, well, look, I've got 150 pieces of evidence to support that I'm right and you're wrong. And, uh, and the individual is, is, might as well be made out of, uh, of steel. Actually, if they're made out of steel, it'd be easier to change them because the mind is very, is very mechanical. All the lower bodies are mechanical in nature. Only soul is eternal only soul like i said soul knows who's seeing knowing and being soul enjoys um as as it reaches into these high states it becomes omnipotent omnipresent omniscient soul is basically we're all miniature gods among other gods but not the ego. The ego the ego is something else. The ego is the cow self, the negative self. It's at a lower much lower vibration. The ego is is mechanical. And it's not bad, but the tail can't be wagging the dog. And so when the ego is in charge of our lives, look out. And when dogma and superstition and cherished beliefs become the the established um in the life of the individual as being iron or steel, 
or stronger than this, then the person can't accept anything outside of his cherished beliefs and opinions. And they become unteachable. The master cannot teach them, and they simply are not ready. And it's not that they're bad or evil or, or anything like that, or stupid or any of this stuff. They just have this um, dogmatic belief system when then they can't their 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 bucket is filled with mud and they can't accept anything else and it's the way it is we've all gone through incarnations where we were like this many times so it's not a judgment now you get other people who some people might call evil or negative or and um like Milarepa was an example where he did black magic when he was young but they're able to empty their their bucket and they're able to be humble and you look at some of these individuals and they might have a checkered past but they're open and they're and they're and they are willing to let go perhaps because life has been so difficult for them and they see the error of their ways and they have humility which is something that the vain don't understand what the meaning of the word. They have humility, so they're willing to empty their bucket, empty their cup, and um, they're willing to receive the blessings of, of the Hure or God, and the blessings of the Master. And good karma is really about being earning the right to meet the Master and being able to go home to learn the ways of, of Vardenkar, or bilocation, or soul projection because God's not going to descend into the human body um, we have to raise our awareness and our consciousness we have to become aware total awareness via the sound current and via the methods of Vardenkar of bilocation of soul projection and people have tried to do meditation and it doesn't work because they're waiting for this God consciousness to descend down into the human state. And it doesn't work that way. Passivity doesn't work. Passivity is not an effective method. We have to be active, but we have to be active in the correct way. And that's what, where the master comes in. And we learn through the various Varden masters and we go through these experiences. And we have to be very humble and we have to follow this middle path of being neither for nor against. Well, I've covered a lot of ground here. I appreciate you listening. And I will say the blessings of the Varda Masters. Baraka Bashad, may, may the blessings be.